All right, welcome back. We'll go ahead and get started with Tiffany. Uh, welcome, Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany Petra is a sensory manager at Yakima Chief Hops and holds a BA from the University of Northern Iowa. And in 2014, she completed the UC Davis Applied Sensory and Consumer Science Certificate Program while building her first raw materials sensory program. Uh, it's important to note that this is a beginner's guide to hop sensory analysis. As you can imagine, in, in half an hour, um, this, is, this is something you can only cover so much of, and it's a very deep topic. Uh, the, the, the seminar is tailored to the sensory novice, and in this seminar, Tiffany will demonstrate hop aroma analysis procedures and discuss the role sensory plays in quality assessment. This, sense, this session aims to shed some light on what hop merchants and brewery customers are examining during selection season and will serve as a starting point for anyone looking to build a more formalized hop sensory program. So without further ado, I will let you take it away, Tiffany. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, let me see if I can get this screen share going. How's that working? Good. All right, perfect. So thank you so much for having me. I was pretty thrilled when Anne and Melissa reached out to me to present. I love talking about sensory analysis, so um, I appreciate you having me here on the last day of the convention. I am situated in the Yakima Chief Aroma Dome, uh, which was, is our sensory lab, and it was completed um, in peak COVID times in our summer, um, so not many people have had the opportunity to actually see our space, but I'm excited to host you virtually here today. Um, as Blake mentioned, today is meant to be a pretty brief overview of some foundational concepts of sensory analysis of hops, and it's just an opportunity to give growers um, a bit of context as to what we're looking for when we receive hops and other merchants are as well, and uh, what brewing customers are looking at when they're assessing hops. Um, I hope this will give you some easy tools to access if you're thinking of starting to perform sensory analysis on the farm. And the intent is really to build on this content in uh, future meetings. So we're already talking 2022, fingers crossed, we can do something in person with lots of hops flying everywhere. Um, that would be so thrilling to me. So I only have 30 minutes, uh, which is not very long. So let's just dive in. Um, the agenda, quick run through of uh, different quality, hop quality specs that suppliers and brewers are looking at. Um, discuss basic ways to use your senses to analyze hops. I uh, will demonstrate a couple of analysis methods and then discuss some best practices and then uh, talk about the hop lexicon at the end and the importance of using the same descriptive language when assessing hops. So of course there are many quality parameters to consider before uh, hops are even received here, but for the sake of time, we can just start with harvest. And uh, one of the first questions we might ask is, was this variety harvested um, during the optimum picking window? Um, of course, weather conditions can change those dates, I'm sure. And I know that different suppliers might have different definitions of early, middle, and late. Uh, pick dates by variety, but this is certainly something that customers um, ask about a lot of times. Uh, they really have a genuine interest in wanting to know if it's been harvested at its peak maturity. So uh, not, you know, they'll smell the hops and let us know if it, there's basically no aroma, it just smells grassy, vegetal or green plant material like, or um, if it's kind of swung the other direction and uh, demonstrate some poor aroma quality. So, um, you know, not typical and maybe high onion garlic aromas. There's obviously still a lot of work to be done before we can draw a direct correlation between specific aroma qualities and uh, harvest date, but um, you know, it is something that brewers are definitely interested in. From a safety perspective, of course, we want to make sure that the bales are delivered within moisture and temperature specs, um, you know, monitoring to make sure that um, they're not going to be too hot um, before we put them into our cold warehouse. So we're always making sure that they're, they're safe to receive on our premises. 
Uh, there's a lot to take in visually um, when looking at hops, um, but an obvious place to start uh, is to look for any severe pest and disease damage. And you can see actually in the top right there, um, there's a picture of hop cones that are severely impacted by um, powdery mildew. And this is definitely a lot that is not going to show very well to customers and it would be pretty difficult to convince someone to dry hop a beer with this. Um, so it's just something we want to have our eye out for. Um, we really look for green cones that are uniform. Um, speaking of color, you can see a couple of examples here. So we're really looking at um, the, the color to be representative of the variety and the growing region. So on the bottom left, there's actually, this is an example of an Idaho 7 sample out of Washington. And then right next to it is a citrus sample from Oregon. And very different green colors, but I would consider them to be basically true to type. Um, so they would both receive pretty high ratings, um, especially because we don't see a large percentage of damaged brown cones compared to the green material. Um, we will also look for mainly intact cones. So not wanting to see a high degree of shatter um, just to, to ensure and to check that all of the hops have been kilned and baled uh, appropriately. Of course, um, the WSDA will perform leaf seed and stem analysis and let us know that the bales are full of hop cones and not other plant material. And then our quality lab is gonna run brewing values to make sure they're within spec for each variety. So sensory evaluation means that we are making or taking measurements using our senses. And honestly, this is just um, a pretty quick training that I give our um, bale receiving crew um, at the beginning of harvest every year. So um, we talk about, yeah, you're given lots of tools. You have a moisture probe, you have a temperature gun, you're given scales, and you can take those measurements, but you also have extra tools that you can leverage, and we would expect that you would use them to make some, some best judgment. Um, so, you, you know, uh, based on the last side, you know, using your site to examine the hop sample, uh, what does it look like? Does it have obvious pest or disease damage? Is the bale mostly brown instead of green or greenish yellow? Uh, if you're finding a lot of brown cones, can you start looking at other bales to see if, if this is a trend through the whole lot or there's just a few that are affected? Um, they can also use their hands. So as they're taking that sample and looking at it, uh, they can start to feel it and, and see if the, the cones are mostly intact and staying intact or if they're shattering upon touch or, or maybe they take it out and it immediately falls apart. It's just powder. Um, that could mean that it was over kilned or that um, you know, it was the bottom of the kiln bed and they maybe need to go check another bale as well. Um, are the cones too wet? You know, we're also looking at that. We don't want to receive something that's too high in moisture. Um, so a quick check is, you know, to try to break the cones apart between your hands. If it's just kind of balling up and not really breaking down, that might be an indicator. If you squeeze it and it retains that shape, um, it's probably an indication that the strig is still retaining too much moisture and those weren't kilned long enough. So to uh, further check um, if you are on the right track, you can also take a quick smell of the sample. And so we practice smelling some standards, but they're going to look, you know, maybe if it's really high shatter, uh, they can take a smell of that. Does it smell oxidized? So I make everyone smell an isovaleric acid standard, cheesy sweat socks, it's really disgusting. Uh, if I smell it before noon, it's, it's a rough one, but um, you know, they're checking to see if, if those hop oils are already starting to oxidize and uh, that's when they need to raise their hand and say, there's something going on here. On the flip side, it could smell under dried if they've noticed that it's kind of retaining its shape and they give it a smell. Is it, you know, does it smell musty, kind of like composting leaves? Um, again, those are both things that we would wanna know and be made aware of so we could do some further investigation throughout that entire lot. So if you have, um, you know, to kind of dive a little bit more into how to assess the aroma of hops, I wanted to talk through a couple of methods that are used throughout the industry. And, you know, as Blake mentioned, this is pretty introductory. So if you've been in the industry for a long time, the traditional hop hand rub is not new to you. Um, but this is perhaps one of the most widely used assessment methods, um, probably because a lot of brewers use it when they uh, perform hop selection. You know, they visit their supplier and, uh, decide which lots are going to satisfy their contracts for the year. Um, it's a pretty easy method to set up and to execute. Um, it does require a lot of cleanup, so that's something to note, but 
um, essentially you just take a small handful of cones and you're going to uh, rub the cones between your hands, slowly rupturing those lupulin glands. And then I always like to give a little fluff and then smell the sample. So it's, you know, no, no barrier to access there. You really can just grab any hop sample and, and rub it and smell it. Um, so it is considered the um, industry standard for hop selection. Um, and it has other advantages too. You know, it's limited sample prep. It gives you that opportunity to assess the overall quality as the previous slides mentioned. You know, you can perform that tactile and visual evaluation to see if there's any obvious damage. Um, you, but there are some disadvantages as well. There's a aroma carryover. So you can see that there's already lupulin buildup on my hands. Um, you can imagine after six samples or so, it's gonna be pretty thick. So the chance of taking aroma from one sample and applying it to the next is pretty high. It's not super standardized. Um, it's, you know, you, you might be grabbing different amounts of hops. You might be smelling them in the same order as your partner. Um, it's a very fatiguing method. You're probably literally getting hop material into your uh, sinuses. And it can be challenging to apply this method to other sample types. So it's relatively easy to break down uh, whole leaf hops between your hands. But when you're trying to apply this to T90 pellets, uh, that proves to be a little bit more painful and challenging, I guess. Um, so let's see if I can advance. So to answer that, um, the American Society of Brewing Chemists came out with the hop grind sensory evaluation method in 2018. And I'm not really going to demonstrate this one because the thought of grinding hop samples and that noise coming through Zoom sounds pretty awful, but it's also pretty simple. Um, it's an easily accessible method. So you essentially just weigh 10 grams of hop cones or pellets. You grind that sample using a blade grinder and then um, you want to make sure that you have a similar powder, uh, coarseness of powder across all your samples. And then you place it in an amber glass jar with a lid and evaluate it within 60 minutes of grinding. Um, and when the ASBC was developing that method, we did do some triangle tests to see uh, that if panelists could tell the difference between a freshly ground sample and ones that had been sitting out for certain amounts of time. And we did see that around 60 minutes, they noted um, higher oxidation levels, um, so higher cheesy off notes. And uh, we definitely recommend tossing it after it's been at room temperature for 60 minutes. Um, so it has, you know, it's a manageable sample prep. It is more standardized. I would say that it does have some fatiguing uh, qualities. You are still smelling that hot material. So there's probably a set number of samples that you can uh, ask panelists to perform in, in one sitting. And for us, that's you know eight samples during uh, most of the year and 10 samples at a time during harvest because it needs to be high throughput. So some quickly, just some best practices when um, starting to assess samples. You want to start by asking yourself what data you want to collect. So if you're going to build a ballot, um, make sure that you're asking the right questions and you'll be collecting the, the data in the way that you will be easy to process. Um, so talking with the key stakeholders in your organization, what do you want to know about these samples uh, so that you're not wasting anyone's time. Um, you also are training panelists maybe on how to smell hops and maybe you've come up with this cool method and you've gotten everyone in the same room, but don't ever forget that you need to train panelists on how to fill out that ballot as well. So that takes one extra session, but walking everyone through it and making sure they fill it out to its completeness is really important and it'll make sure that you're not chasing people down trying to fill in those gaps. Um, pretty standard uh, best practices would be to blind code samples mask the sample appearance, uh, randomize the sample order across panelists to minimize biases. And we always, I always recommend incorporating a rest and recovery period between samples. So for us, uh, one to two minutes seems to be pretty uh, sufficient. So panelists are directed to wait one full minute between samples. And uh, another way you can reduce aroma carryover and fatigue is actually to smell something neutral between samples. So um, using the back of your hand works pretty well, as long as you don't wear scented lotion, which you shouldn't be doing in panel anyway. Um, or we sometimes use these uh, unscented moist towelettes um, that work really well as a reset. Um, you can find these, I don't know if any of you get these on airplanes back when we could travel a lot, right? But um, they seem to work pretty well. 
Um, and then lastly, I think, you know, doing your best to control the environment. So not everyone needs to, if you're just getting started, you don't need an aromadome to assess your samples, uh, but you definitely want to do your best to find a place where it's relatively distraction free. There's not a lot of other odors that are competing with what you're assessing um, and that it's a comfortable temperature and environment and panelists can relax and, and stay focused. So you have a couple of options of methods, um, but how will you actually begin to describe your impressions of the samples? Uh, this is where the hop lexicon comes in. And a key element of a sensory panel is that they are trained on a common lexicon or that they're using the same set of words to describe a product. And you know, developing a lexicon is a pretty big process. Um, it involves taking you know, a wide spectrum a lot of samples and putting them in front of panelists. So you're going to want, you know, high, medium, low alpha varieties. You're going to want varieties from all over the world, um, different growing regions, and put them in front of panelists and ask them to write down just what do you smell in each sample. And that's a pretty free form process. And it can take some time because you're, you know, panelists are tapping out after 10 samples. Um, but once you have that giant list, you can take that list and start to consolidate it. So one, you're gonna filter it for words that aren't very descriptive. So let's take out the ones like clean and bright and nice. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not descriptive enough and I can't, I can't really define that. Uh, then you're gonna look for things that maybe overlap or seem to say the same thing. So every term on your list should be distinct and universally understood. And you'll wanna go through that with your panelists um, during this entire process. Um, and an important piece is not just having that term, but you want to take it one step further and actually define your terms. So I like to use this example because it's a, you know, kind of a buzzword in our industry, but dank, um, you know, whenever someone says those hops are dank or this smells dank, I always say, what do you mean by that? Because I get such a range of answers. Um, some gr brewers will say, I just mean that it's overripe, maybe too resinous and has some strong onion garlic aromas going on. Okay, so that's one bucket. Uh, someone else might say, it makes me think of a musty basement. So that scary wet basement uh, at grandma's farmhouse, uh, that makes me think of dank. And then of course, I think it's something that people associate with cannabis. So uh, making sure to have your definition next to that term uh, ensures that your panelists know what you're talking about on the ballot. And to take that one step further, um, you can actually use reference standards for training. So this ensures that everyone is using the same word to mean the same thing. Um, so I put some examples here, but you know, we have garlic, that's our term and then garlic cloves would be our definition. And then we use allyl disulfide as our standard that panels are smelling to say, aha, uh -huh, garlic. So they see the word, they understand the definition, and then they're smelling. We'll do the same thing for other aromas, you know, green grass. So we're describing that as freshly cut green grass um, on a nice summer day, that sweet green grass smell. And then they're smelling cis-3-hexanol to get that aroma standard solidified in their brain. Um, it is, you know, standards kits come in all shapes and sizes and prices. So chemical standards can run a little bit high. Um, they're expensive, although they do store for quite a long time. They're easy to standardize. Sometimes they don't capture the full essence of what you think the term is. So you can look elsewhere. Um, there, you know, some options would be essential oils, flavored syrups, the kind that you would find at maybe like a coffee stand. Um, or common grocery store items, those work really well. You know, there are some uh, aromas that are really hard to capture. So some of the tropical fruits, for example, are really hard to capture in a vial. Um, so there are days when we'll just have a funky fruits pop-up training and invite all panelists to come, well, now one at a time, <laughs> but at a different time, to come and actually take time and smell different fruits and have that recent experience saying, okay, passion fruit, it's not something I eat every day, so I don't have a strong association, but they're taking time and they're smelling it or they're eating it, and then they can um, confidently fill it out on their ballot. Um, training and repetition really matter. Um, I've seen panelists go from, you know, smelling a set of standards and only being able to detect in a blind setting 25% of them correctly, and that can be pretty, uh, 
sad. <laughs> um, I've seen panelists feel pretty defeated, but by challenging them and saying, can you just try smelling your standard set once or twice a week for the next four or five weeks and I want to quiz you again. And then I add in uh, duplicates, so I add in replicates and then I take away some to make sure that they aren't just going through a checklist in their brain and watching them after one or two months be able to identify 90 plus percent. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, we're really training for, um, you know, a, a consistent response to a stimulus. So the example I always give is, you know, seeing a red light and then you know to stop. And that's what we're really trying to do. You know, you're training on garlic, you're training on pine, you're training on green grass, so much so that when you smell it in a hop sample, you know exactly what, what standard to put down. So I, I know that I smell green grass in this hop sample because I've trained on it. And so many people when they start in sensory say, it's a familiar smell, but I don't know how to put words to it. And this is, this is the way that you really drive that home and make panelists feel empowered to um, put down the correct aromas on a palate. So I know I ripped through that, but I always, <laughs> like to give more time for question and answers. Um, I hope that we are able to do, you know, something way more interactive in the future. Um, I always say that it's pretty boring to talk about sensory. It's way more fun to do sensory. So I still am crossing my fingers for 2022, um, but I appreciate you sticking it out with me virtually in the screen world today. Um, there are plenty of great resources out there to get you started. I've put a few on the screen. All of these will have, you know, methods of analysis and webinars, technical papers. Um, and additionally, you can always reach out to me or the team at Yakima Chief. We're happy to answer questions. Um, we really aim to bring brewers and growers together. And I, I do believe that sensory analysis can help strengthen that relationship. So um, I guess that is all I had for you today. And we will see if any questions popped up after my whirlwind presentation. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tiffany. That was great. And a really good, like you said, rudimentary understanding of how you guys approach sensory and, and some good tips for everyone else here too. Just checking the Q&A, looks like we might've had one pop up. Okay, here we go. What's your favorite part of sensory and in your opinion is the most beneficial use of a sensory department? My favorite part, <laughs> um, that's a good question. I love hop sensory and I love drinking beer too, but um, I, I love the training aspect of it. I love giving, you know, one of the ways that we use sensory analysis at Yakma Chief is um, of course to collect data, but also as a great tool to empower all of our employees to be really knowledgeable about our products and hopefully represent growers in a really good light. Um, so bringing departments and people who don't typically have, you know, access to hops, maybe they work in an office setting or, you know, they think all hops smell the same and they, they're remembering the time when it was just high alpha and so they don't necessarily love the smell of hops, um, but being able to educate people and take them through the full spectrum of varieties and to show them that side by side, see, see these differences, um, that training part is really, really fun and I, I love doing that. Um, the most, let's see, I mean, there are different ways you can leverage and it just, it depends on, on where the sensory department, um, you know, it can be utilized as a quality control aspect and during harvest, that's sort of the function that we play. You know, as we're receiving lots, we really wanna do a quick quality check on them and make sure that they're within specification on what we would expect of each variety. You can use, uh, Obviously for any research projects, we are, you know, have a pretty robust beer sensory program and using that to actually take it one step further and say, yeah, it can smell like this on the table, but what's it gonna do in beer? Um, and really pushing the boundaries on that. Um, and then you can also, gosh, I'm trying to think of other ways that we use sensory analysis, but um, oh, I mean, incorporating it into a breeding program, I suppose. So for new product development or variety development, you know, as, you know, is this a novel variety? So if you have a trained panel that's used to smelling a lot of hops, um, they're gonna be a good indicator to say, well, hold the phone. This smells way different than anything else I've ever smelled before. This is a novel variety. Or, um, you know, they might help you decide that 
determine that this variety smells very similar to this other variety that maybe is less sustainable. So let's try to do some brewing trials and replace and see if we can we can find a good suitable replacement that's more more sustainable for the industry. So a lot of different ways. It just I mean that's up to your organization on how you want to leverage um, that group and the data. Great. We have another interesting one in these times. How have you been handling sensory with COVID restrictions? Oh, I've been. It's been exhausting. <laughs> uh, we have, you know, as I mentioned, we finished the Aroma Dome and then no one could come here. So that was pretty disappointing, but uh, we've been able to, my team is awesome. And, you know, where we used to be able to get eight people in at once and collect that data in half an hour, we now do one panelist at a time in a half an hour. So it just takes us many more hours and, you know, strict cleaning protocols. Um, we've I've decided to not be as controlled and married to method as much as I usually am. I think a lot of brewers and brewing um, sensory programs have had to make those changes too, but by allowing panelists to, we kind of operate like a takeout restaurant. So come in, get your hop sample test kit or testing kit and then go um, perform analysis and then bus those samples separately. So making sure everyone has adequate space and. I mean, the show has to go on. We still need to be collecting data and um, yeah, so it just takes a lot longer. <laughs> what are some good options for sensory analysis kits? Let's see. So there are uh, really good flavor standards kits um, from Aroxa and Flavor Active. Siebel will have good. Those are really good for um, spiking beer samples. So if that's the, the way you want to go, um, Otherwise, I have a list that has kind of been a running list of chemical standards that I use from um, Siebel, or not Siebel, I'm sorry, uh, Sigma Aldridge, and, and make those myself. And then you can also find some essential oils to kind of offset some that you weren't able to find. So I'm happy to share that with anyone. I'll put my email address in the chat and see if people want to reach out for that list. This one's interesting given the season. I'm going to skip to this one real quick. Did smoke exposed hops have any sensory positives or was it all negative? I think in general, we saw that, um, you know, there was obviously a range of impact. So the intensity of smoke level, if it was a pretty high intensity rated by our panelists, uh, we did see, you know, the citrus and tropical uh, aromas get very masked. You know, they could have still been there, but as far as in the raw hop sensory, uh, it was definitely the dominant aroma. Um, it, we saw an increase in, in woody associations as well, so high cedar response or um, pine wood, but then it always had that smoky um, off note associated with it as well. Um, as you found, you know, we were, we were always looking at the entire hop profile, so it's not just we looked at the amount of smoke and then we wanted to see if there is still enough, um, you know, citrus and tropical and stone fruit aromas that were coming through. That was taken into consideration and in how the hop was rated overall. Um, so I didn't see it consistently, um, you know, bringing in extra good <laughs> aromas, but uh, we did actually see it kind of mute some of the other ones. Um, so still a lot of work to be done, but i um, happy to talk more offline about that with anyone who's really interested. Cool. Last question before we wrap up. Do you have a quantitative scale, say one to nine, that you use to measure color? Do you implement any image analyses for cone quality? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, we actually just use a one to five scale on color, and we're doing that based off of percent brown cones to green. Um, so it's not really a, a color or hue, I guess. It's more about a percent of damaged cones to, to nice cones. Um, and we do use pictures to train our eyes, but it's actually just a group of individuals who are assessing them right now. So, you know, in the future, I think we'd love to incorporate some AI so that we don't have to utilize as much of our personnel to do that, but we're going to have to train a model first. So um, that's what we really focused on this year was getting more eyeballs on the samples and coming up with a consensus um, on what that rating would be so that we could train a model in the future. Because we do take pictures of everything as well. Excellent. 
Well, thanks again, Tiffany, for sharing some of your knowledge with us today. Hopefully, we'll all get to come check out the Aroma Dome, which sounds yes. amazing. Yes, visit uh, me. <laughs> soon, uh, as, as things improve here in 2021, hopefully. And thanks for all the uh, attendees. Had some great questions as well. Uh, so we're at 1030 right now, which means we're going to segue, and I'm going to actually pass the mic to Jackie Brophy and Ann George, who are going to uh, jump into the Good Binds program through HGA. And I am supposed to say one thing real quick, just as a reminder, since this is the last day of convention and we can't be together this year, uh, we do wish to close things out on a fun note. So we'll end the day with a very brief outgoing statement from myself, uh, outgoing president myself um, with a statement and order of the hop nominations and a, a group cheers uh, for, for all of you that wish to join us. So have a beer ready. And that will start at one and we'll be cheersing by 1.30 is the goal. So just a quick reminder there. All right, uh, without further ado, I'll hand it off to Ann and Jackie.